Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Samuel Schallenberger, and I am a part of our College Programming and Orientation Office here at UChicago. So welcome to one of our many online orientation summer series webinars. Um, if you have been able to join us before, welcome back. If you have not yet, this webinar, just like all of the ones that we host here in the CPO, will be recorded and posted to our website. So if you need to dip out at any point during today's session, you can always go back and revisit. Or if you just want to check it out again, feel free to. We like to get it up within several days after the webinar. So you can find that and all of our incoming communications and webinars on our website. I'll throw that link in the chat as well. Today, we are going to hear from College Academic Advising, and we will be specifically talking to you, our transfer students. So making sure that all the information is tailored and accurate, and you're ready to go when you arrive on campus this autumn. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Chris, and we will also have some Q&A at the end. So if you do want to submit any questions or anything like that, feel free to use that function at the bottom of your screen. Great. Thanks, Samuel. Well, welcome, everybody. We appreciate you joining us uh, this afternoon. I guess depending on what time zone you're in, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Chris Kincaid. I'm one of the assistant deans of students in the uh, college dean of students office and specifically in the Office of Academic Advising, as is my colleague Alex Silverman, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later. Uh, as, as you are all likely aware, um, or you should be, uh, Alex and I work, although we're in the advising office, part of our responsibility is to work with incoming transfer students and work through the transfer credit evaluation process. So that is why uh, he and I are hosting this webinar this afternoon. Uh, next slide, Alex. Uh, just to give you an idea of our path uh, for the afternoon, um, and, and we are going to try to shoot for around 30 minutes or so of content. Uh, we'd like to leave plenty of time for questions at the end, um, but this is an idea of what some of the things we'll be talking about. It's, it's pretty general, so we'll get into some more specifics, but we just want to give you an update on where we are with the process. I know I've received some questions about that, and those are valid questions at this point. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming pre-registration period, what that looks like, and some of the next steps as they relate to pre-registration. Uh, back to the transfer credit evaluations, we're going to talk about some of the things yet to come uh, following pre-registration, uh, moving into the start of the quarter. And then Alex is going to cover um, some, some issues surrounding your status as a transfer slash first year student here at UChicago. So we want to clarify some of the things surrounding uh, your status. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll get to some questions at the end. Um, the Q&A feature is available. Uh, so if you would, would please use that to ask any questions, we'd appreciate it. Uh, depending on how the, um, the session goes, we may be able to respond in the Q&A uh, feature to some of the questions, and then some of them we can certainly address verbally at the end. Uh, one thing I would ask is that uh, for your questions, that you keep them relatively general in nature. Um, unfortunately, Alex and I won't be able to address any specific situations or tell you if a particular course is going to transfer or not. Um, this is not the time nor the place for that. But if you have questions of a general nature that would be broadly applicable uh, to the other participants, then, then we certainly invite you to ask those questions and, and we'll do our best to answer them. Next slide, Alex. Um, so this is what we'd like to accomplish today. Uh, via the agenda I just shared. Uh, we wanna make sure that you understand fully the, the process that you're currently going through and will continue to go through uh, up through the start of the quarter. Uh, we want to talk about pre-registration, as I mentioned, and make sure that you understand how your transfer credit evaluation, uh, the implications that has on pre-registration. Um, a theme I think you'll see through this webinar is the importance of your academic advisor as a resource. Alex and I are, are certainly uh, heavily involved in this process and have been identified to each of you as, as a contact uh, for this process, um, but, but your advisor is also going to play a vital role through this process, and we want to make sure you understand uh, kind of the delineation there. And then again, back to the uh, your classification as a transfer slash first year student, we want to make sure that that is as clear as possible. 
So the first thing we're going to uh, cover is just kind of where we're at in the process and, and just provide you with some updates on that process. So Alex, if we go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've received a few emails just kind of generally asking um, if there's anything you should be doing at this point or anything else you can do to, to, to speed up the process. In most cases, the answer to that question is probably not. Um, we're at a point in the process right now where you have submitted your information through the admissions office, your uh, the syllabi, the courses that you've taken, the syllabi, and other information about those courses. Um, I know the vast majority of you have submitted a final transcript, and if you haven't done that, um, as soon as those are available, you should submit those to admissions. So we have most of the information we need. Uh, we're in the process now of actually evaluating that information. And at UChicago, our process is very heavily, um, very heavily involves our faculty and academic departments. So a lot of your courses are currently with those departments and we're beginning to receive feedback and um, from those, those departments. And we are collecting that information um, and then moving forward, uh, we will be letting you know the results of those evaluations. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna try to do that as that second bullet point uh, explains, we're gonna try to get you as much information as possible prior to the pre-registration period, uh, which begins on August 14th. So any decisions that we have at that point, we're gonna try to, to let you know those. Um, and then uh, we'll also, I'm gonna skip down a bullet point, but any other information that we're waiting on. So um, that could be the fact that the department just hasn't gotten back to us on a particular course yet, and we're, we're waiting on them. We will make sure that that, that is noted. Um, if there's more information that we do in fact need from you, uh, we'll also be letting you know that as early as possible. Um, as you can imagine, sometimes, or as you know, sometimes the syllabi for courses are, are more helpful in some cases than others and contain more content, more substantive information than others. So if there is a case where we need more information or a department is asking for something additional to be able to make their decision, we will let you, let you know that. And our goal is to release this information to you on August 7th. And I'll share on the next slide how we're going to do that. But but that's about a week prior to when pre-registration starts. So we're going to do our best to make sure you have as much of that information as possible with a little time leading up to pre-registration to do some planning um, with your advisor uh, related to pre-registration. All right, next slide, Alex. And this is what this is a little bit more detail about what you can expect to receive um, when we do release that information on August 7th. Um, we're going to be entering our decisions into a new transfer student portlet that's going to be found in your my.uchicago student portal. Those that's the path right there, uh, my academic page or your academic page. Um, and then there will be a college transfer credit option. At least this is what we're told the path is going to be because I want to focus on a particular word in that first sentence, and that is new. Uh, this is actually uh, a new process that we're going through this year. We're, we're doing some things differently from what we've done in the past. And so um, it's we're, we're learning some things along the way. And um, we will certainly, uh, hopefully you won't see any of the, the challenges that we faced on, on your end. But just to, to point out that this is a new process, and, and what we're saying, uh, as, as I've said, this is the path that we've been told you'll follow to get there, but we'll certainly give you um, updated information if anything were to change. On that, in that portlet, um, you're going to be able to see the results of your credit evaluation um, and, and how those, those courses were evaluated. And there are several, um, several options that, that you may see. Um, when you look at each individual course. And each individual course will be uh, included uh, in that portlet. So one of the possibilities is that your course is approved, not only approved, but actually approved equivalent to a UChicago course. So for example, if you took a, a general chemistry course at your institution, our chemistry department evaluated, they said, yes, this is approved uh, to transfer for credit. And it's also equivalent to our chemistry uh, 111 course. That will, be, um, that will be shown specifically in, the, uh, in your portal. 
There are other courses that a department might say, yes, generally speaking, this is a, this is a course that we would accept as, as for credit, but it may not be equivalent to a specific course that we have here at U Chicago. So there are a couple of ways those courses can be applied to your academic record. One would be just as a general elective credit. It would count toward the 42 courses that the minimum of 42 courses that you need to graduate. It won't meet a specific major requirement necessarily. It may not meet uh, a core requirement, but it will count as a general elective uh, towards your graduation requirements. Another kind of general uh, approval that you might see is if it's approved to meet uh, one part of the core. So for example, if, if we have a class, it's not necessarily equivalent to one of our courses, but it broadly fits into the humanities. Our, the, you may see that uh, you've received credit toward the humanities core. Um, and I'll talk a little bit um, more about what some of those core courses could possibly mean for you uh, later on in the presentation. Um, it's possible that, that the courses might not transfer. We, if you look at the, uh, the transfer section of the catalog, there's a list of courses that uh, have been deemed non-transferable that will be denied transfer credit. You can take a look uh, more closely at that if you haven't done so already, uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, a course may be denied for credit. Um, and then there's kind of the, the, the final category of, of classes where a decision might be pending, and it could be pending for a couple of different reasons. Uh, as I suggested earlier on, one is that we might just be waiting for the department to complete their review of the course. And if that's the case, then we'll note that in the portal. Uh, it might be the case that uh, we need more information from you. And, and in those circumstances, we'll notify you what that what we need um, and then ask you to provide that to us so that we can pass it along the, to the department so they can finalize their review. So those are those are the, the different categories that you'll see uh, on August 7th when, when we release the, the new portal. Um, again, assuming everything goes well, August 7th is, is our target date. Uh, the one thing I'll mention, I think uh, at the bottom, it's cut off of my screen, but I think there's another bullet point down there. Um, there is going to be a field in the portal that's that's kind of a summary. Um, that's going to be blank initially. And again, I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that you might eventually see in that field. But just as a heads up, when you see that that summary field is blank, uh, it, it is intentionally so, at least early on in this process. Alex, you're up. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm uh, Alex Silverman, and uh, Chris and I are uh, partnering and helping to welcome you all as incoming transfer students and helping with your transfer credits and among other things that we are talking about today. So again, um, glad to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking first about pre-registration. As um, Chris mentioned, we are uh, getting to as much information we have by August 7th, partly in view of the fact that you will be pre-registering for autumn quarter courses starting on um, uh, August 14th. That week, Monday, for August 14th through Friday, August 18th, is the main incoming student pre-registration period. Um, so again, we want you to have as much information um, as you need by that time. Um, one of the things I'll mention about that week is that you will continue to get a lot of information about that week not just as incoming transfer students, but as incoming students. So if I may make a plug for a webinar that will be later in the summer as part of the summer webinar series for incoming students, there is a webinar focused on pre-registration on Friday, August 11th, where you're gonna be able to see you know, where do you go to pre-register and what does the inter interface look like and how do you rank courses? So uh, any questions about that, you're gonna be getting a lot of information uh, about that. So I'll continue to you know, keep this focused on uh, things for uh, incoming transfer students in particular. And uh, one of the things to note about that has to do with your uh, required academic advising meeting over the summer. So as you uh, probably know, you are required to meet with your academic advisor over the summer prior to pre-registering. And um, as an incoming transfer student, it might be um, useful for you to hold that meeting later in the summer, perhaps even after August 7th, when you know more information about uh, what courses you'll be getting for uh, 
credit. I understand that some transfer students have already met with their advisor. That's completely valid. That completely counts. Your advisor remains available to help with any additional questions that arise as more information comes out. Um, but if you would like to have that required meeting during the week of August 7th, or even into the, the pre-registration week, if that works out for you for one reason uh, or another, you are welcome to do so. Uh, I do want to stress that you will not have access to pre-registration until you have that meeting with your academic advisor. So if you wait until say Monday or Tuesday of that week, you won't be able to access pre-registration before that meeting. Nonetheless, if it works for you to have that meeting, then you're very welcome to do so. Um, as far as how your transfer credit evaluation would factor in to your pre-registration selections, one of, if not the main thing to, 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 keep it, to keep in mind here is if you have credit for a particular course, then it probably makes sense not to bid on that course. So for example, if you were granted credit for general chemistry, to continue with the chemistry example, um, then it probably doesn't make sense to bid on general chemistry. You probably want to take, say, organic chemistry. Um, if you'll be continuing with chemistry, uh, for example, or if you have received um, credit for art core and maybe your art core requirement has been entirely satisfied, then you might not want to bid on any art core classes. You, you, you still could, um, but you might not want to. So um, those are the kinds of things to keep in mind when you see your credit evaluation as far as how that can inform the pre-registration process. One thing that's also important to keep in mind, and this is especially important to keep in mind for incoming transfer students, is that um, what's happening that week of August 14th through 18th, the courses that are, that are available for pre-registration are mostly consists of standard first-year courses, a lot of core courses, a lot of courses at the intro level. So one very natural question that incoming transfer students have is, what does it look like to register for other more advanced courses, which of course you might very well need to be in. And there is a plan for that. Um, incoming students register at in in stages. You had you you uh, you had your humanities pre-registration, um, and you're going to have the main pre-registration period. Following from that, um, the, the next uh, steps are as follows. So. Uh, you are going to be able to, well, first of all, schedules will be released on uh, about uh, September 11th. It, and by released, I mean the results of the pre-registration process um, will be kind of finalized then. Um, but starting then, you'll be able to meet with your academic uh, advisor that week of September 11th to meet with them and make additional schedule changes. And that will include the adding of advanced courses that were not available during that pre-registration week. Um, and this is, of course, important to keep in mind because, um, uh, you know, one, I think, question that transfers also happened, which you actually got before the webinar was, as an incoming transfer student, do I have any sort of priority for registration? And um, this is the answer to that question because in meeting with your advisor that week of September 11th, that is prior to any opportunity that any other incoming students have to make changes to their schedule. So um, that's a kind of earlier time frame that we're making available um, to you to, to be able to make those changes to add into organic chemistry or whatever it might, um, whatever it is you might need to take. As far as how to set up that meeting is concerned, um, I encourage you to reach out to your advisor proactively. As you sit here right now, you might not know whether you want to have that meeting because you, you don't know yet what the results of pre-registration will be or what the results of the transfer credit evaluation process will be. So there's no obligation to reach out to your advisor right now, but, but you also could if you feel like, yes, I will want to have that meeting. Um, but you can also reach out later. Uh, I just don't want you to be shy in reaching out to your advisor because again, during that meeting, while you're with them one-on-one, -on -one, they will be hand placing you into courses. I mean, assuming there's space and there's not instructor consent and, and, and so on, but there's, there's, you can make schedule changes during that meeting. So I wanna make sure you have that opportunity to do so if that would be, um, you know, uh, what is, if that would be was right for your situation.
Um, and with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Chris to talk about the next step in the process. Yep, so what comes after pre-registration as we think about getting into the, um, the start of the, the autumn quarter, we're gonna, uh, if you could go to the next slide, Alex. Well, um, here's what kind of finalizing your, your transfer credit looks like. Um, the goal is to, to make sure that these are finalized prior to the start of the autumn quarter, because in addition to uh, the, the period that Alex suggested uh, where you can make some schedule changes, there's also an add drop period during the first three weeks of the um, of the quarter. And so we want you to have, again, we want you to have as much information as possible prior to pre-registration, but anything that we didn't have, hopefully we're able to resolve those things before the start of the quarter. That's That's the goal in this. And then part of the finalization process um, includes a couple of things that I alluded to earlier, where um, on in the portal, that summary field, these are some of the things that you, you will likely see there eventually uh, once, once things are finalized. All transfer students, uh, based on the number of courses that are transferred in, are given a number of quarters in which they're required to complete uh, all of their graduation requirements. Um, so it could be as many as 12 quarters, which is what all University of Chicago students receive uh, if they come in on a traditional timeline in their first year. It, it could be as few as six, depending on how many classes you're bringing in. We do have a residency requirement, though, so, so that's you're going to be here for at least six quarters. Uh, so that will range somewhere between uh, six and 12 and uh, we'll, we'll make you aware of that so that you have that number of quarters available, again, to work with your advisor to plan out um, your academic path through the remainder of those quarters. Uh, for those of you who are coming from semester schools, this will also be a place where we will provide a semester to quarter conversion. Uh, generally speaking, um, if you were part of a, a course sequence that was two semesters long, um, that's equivalent to a, a three quarter sequence here. So in addition to the credit you may receive for those two semester courses, we will add an additional uh, credit on uh, to, to achieve that equivalency. So we'll, we'll explain that and we'll provide those, uh, those conversions uh, in the final uh, evaluation. A couple of things to, to keep in mind once things are finalized and you have all of these answers. Um, when we submit these courses to academic departments, some of them will come back with responses that, that, that give some pretty detailed information. And they may say that this, this course is uh, approved for major credit, should you be interested in a major in that academic department. So you might have that information going forward. You might not. And if you have a class that was approved for general, just general transfer credit, um, but you're going into a major where you think that might be applicable and maybe there's a chance that you could get credit within the major for that class, you are more than welcome to um, take that upon yourself to petition the department. So I guess the kind of the, the message here is that what, what is on the final evaluation, there is still some flexibility for you to, to reach out to departments and see if there's, if there's a chance that you could count this toward a particular requirement, uh, if it makes sense. And that's a good conversation to have again with your advisor uh, to do this in consultation with them to make sure that it, that it makes sense and seems appropriate. Um, there's other departmental petitions that you might, um, Alex, you're going to, you're going to have to remind me what, what I meant by this. Sure. So I think there can be times when, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, in terms of what you might have been thinking, but there are definitely times where you might have, say, a course that wasn't uh, necessarily evaluated by a particular department or wasn't evaluated for a particular purpose, like for art core, for example. Uh, and well, you, we're, we've sent courses for evaluation for the art core requirement and uh, for any that are approved, we will let you know. If any were denied, we'll let you know. But there might be a course that we didn't send along. Maybe it just, it we didn't think it rose to that level, although we might be wrong about that. So we didn't send it to that faculty member. And you might say, well, I'd like to try. You are very welcome to try. We are in no way intend to uh, take away any of your agency in terms of petitioning for additional credit for art core or for 
additional, maybe, maybe there's a, a major you didn't think you were going to want to try out, but now you want to try out and you want to reach out to, to that department. So the, the incoming transfer student uh, credit evaluation process is meant to meant to help you hit the ground running, is to, to, to give you that strong start as far as where you're at. But going from there, you, you always have that agency to um, continue to mold your plan in a way that you see fit. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, thanks, Alex. I do appreciate that. Um, this is why it is great to have a uh, a colleague, uh, partner who who knows their stuff and 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 knows your slides as well as theirs. So thanks, Alex. Um, we can move on to the next slide now, and hopefully, I can remember what all of the bullet points are about on this one. So just again, a few a few items about about moving forward, um, and and we've talked about this generally multiple times. That the idea for your your final transfer evaluation is to utilize in general and then more specific planning with your academic advisor. Um, this question came up on some of the preliminary questions we received, and so I wanted to address this here: the question of um, if you can double major or or put possibly do a, a minor or some combination, uh, I guess, more than just a single major? And the answer to that question is maybe. Uh, this has a lot to do with what I talked about on the last slide with the number of quarters that you are granted and the number of credits that you're bringing in. Um, there is, we certainly try to give you enough quarters so that you can comfortably complete the minimum requirements to get your U Chicago degree. So to get to that 42, course minimum to complete whatever major requirements you have left. That, that is all factored into that. Um, and some will have a little bit more space than others, depending on other factors and other, other credits that's come in. Uh, so there's a possibility that you would have space to, to double major or to add a minor. We just can't guarantee that that is going to be, be available. So again, that's a good conversation to have early on with your advisor to let them know that you're considering um, possibly a double major, and just to make sure that uh, that does fit within the time constraints uh, that are being provided. Um, one recommendation that we have is that you complete your core requirements as early as possible, um, because you will likely have core requirements yet to complete. Um, and so part of the reason for that is that as, uh, and, and Alex will get I'll let Alex talk about this in a little bit, but um, you do have priority for um, core courses as an incoming transfer student. So this, the sooner you get into those courses, the easier it is going to be to get those courses versus moving into your, your um, ultimately your third and fourth years where, where you won't have priority for those classes. So getting those as much as you want to dig into your major and into other things, if you do have core requirements remaining, it's a good idea to, to make sure that those are taken care of early. And then uh, just a particular note um, on humanities and social sciences core. Um, it, is, it is possible that you may receive full credit for either of, of these. However, it's, it's unlikely that you will. So there's a really good chance you'll be taking at least some humanities and some social science core requirements here at the University of Chicago. Um, if you need to take humanities, you should already be uh, registered in a Hume. So you will need to take that humanities in the autumn. And then depending on the plan that you come up with your advisor, you would stay in that humanities sequence until uh, you've, you've fulfilled that requirement based on the number of humanities transfer credits that were approved. The same goes for the social sciences. Uh, if you uh, brought in, let's say you bring in one social science credit one of those is approved, then you would need to take two social science core courses here. And uh, in social sciences, that would that means you need to start in the first course of the sequence and take the first two courses. You can't jump in in the middle of the year and take the second and third courses. You have to start at the beginning and, and then take the number of courses that you need in order to fulfill that requirement. So I just wanted to address that a little bit more specifically um, as a part of the core. Okay, I think Alex, you're up. All right. So, as our for our last uh, topic before we turn to questions, we wanted to address head on the question of transfer students in their first year in the college 
are they first year students? Are you not first year students? And the answer is it depends. Um, in some regards, which I'll go on to talk about on the next uh, on the next slide, in some ways you are considered a first year student. In other ways, you're not. And for us, it really couldn't be otherwise because you are coming here. This is your first year at U Chicago. It is a time of change. It is a time of adjustment, and we want to make sure that you have that extra support. On the other hand, you know, while well, this is your first year in this college, it's not your first year in college, and we have to acknowledge that as well in terms of the kinds of courses you might be taking and so on. So um, during that first year, you will again, you will experience in some ways you're considered a first-year student, in other ways not. After your first year, just so you know, you will be officially classified fully as whatever year makes sense given your graduation timeline. So for uh, some uh, of you, that might mean even a, a fourth year student during your second year at U Chicago. That could mean classified as a third year student, could even mean classified as a second year student, depending upon how many terms you did at your prior institution and what your credit situation is. So, um, uh, but, but in that first year, it is a little more standardized. So just to say a little bit more about the ways in which you're considered a first year student in your first year and the ways in which you are not. Um, let's first look at some examples of ways in which you are. Um, one is that you are required to have a meeting with your academic advisor every quarter. This starts with your required meeting with your academic advisor over the summer, which we've already talked about. It has to happen prior to accessing pre-registration, but that's going to continue for the autumn, winter, and spring terms during your first year. Like all new students in the college, transfer or otherwise, uh, you're required to have that meeting on a quarterly basis because all new students, transfer or otherwise, in virtue of being new students, are Again, going through something new, and we want to make sure that you are set up for success with your degree requirements and just knowing what it is that you need to be doing. And we, our office wants to provide you with, with as much support as possible uh, during that time. Um, also, during your first year, um, that we do classify you as a first year student when it comes to pre registration and bidding priority, which helps out when it comes to core classes. So as Chris mentioned, there is an expectation. Um, well, what we tell non-transfer students is you're expected to complete your core in your first two years. Um, obviously for transfer students that, that you have to um, sort of qualify that in terms of what, what sort of time frame makes sense for an individual student. But the bottom line is the overall point is core is meant to be something that's done earlier. It's more pre-disciplinary as opposed to um, uh, things you will go on to, to do later, which isn't to say you can't take major classes in your first quarter. I'll get to that in a moment. But um, just to say core in the way it's designed is certainly not meant to be uh, not to uh, meant to be held off on, on uh, until the end. So the way the college is set up, students in their first two years have higher priority for core classes over third and fourth year students. So um, and you are a part of that during your first year. So I encourage you to take advantage of that with respect to your core courses. Um, ways in which you are not considered a first year student. Well, to go back to the topic of more advanced courses, I mean, there are many of you who will be taking such courses, including in your first quarter, that it wouldn't make sense for a lot of traditional first year students to take. And indeed that they wouldn't even be eligible for, even if they wanted to take them. But um, of course, as an income and transfer student, they might be precisely the courses that you need to be taking. Um, one example of this I haven't mentioned yet, but is worth mentioning, has to do with courses at the Booth School of Business. Um, normally, first-year students at the college are not allowed to take those classes, and it even says right in the course description, first-year students not admitted. That doesn't apply to you. You are able to take those classes in your first year because, again, it's not your first year in college, so we want to uh, acknowledge that. Um, Another question that comes up sometimes has to do with your year as it relates to applying for internships and other opportunities that you might apply for through a career advancement. Now, career advancement, um, that office uses a system called Handshake, and you are able to be uh, a different year in that system, whatever year makes sense for you, uh, given where you're at in your program and your expected graduation timeline. So, we work with career advancement to um, 
to adjust those levels, those years for individual students, such that if you were interested in an opportunity that is for you know, second year students or third year students or, or whatnot, the appropriate um, positions will be uh, open to you given your um, situation. So that's something as well that we you know, work hard to, um, uh, to, uh, to make sure the students don't um, have any kind of negative impacts with respect to this first year student status question. So uh, overall, we're trying to have the best of both worlds. We're trying to, you're trying, we're trying to um, treat you as first year students in a way that's helpful to you and to treat you as students beyond that level in ways that are helpful to you. And um, uh, so uh, if you have any questions about this going forward, do not hesitate to reach out to myself, to Chris, or to your academic uh, advisor. But um, the intention was to be thoughtful about um, all of these uh, categorizations. So with that, uh, that concludes the uh, kind of prepared portion of the webinar, and we're going to move into questions now. Um, so I think I'm going to, uh, if it's all right, Samuel, maybe stop sharing my screen so we can um, be a little more visible. Yeah, sounds great. And I see we have a few questions in the Q&A. One thing I might mentioned, I think um, the questions that we got in advance, maybe the one that uh, we did, didn't come up in the course of the presentation I want to acknowledge has to do with the taking of the placement tests and whether transfer, incoming transfer students should be taking all, all of the placement tests. Um, the answer to that is you might have, not have to take all of the placement tests, but you should take all of the ones that are appropriate to you, given the, given the directions that we provided to all incoming students. So, so that will mean, for example, that all incoming students transfer or otherwise are expected to take the math placement test. Um, but there could be others as well, whether for chemistry or for languages. And I completely acknowledge that depending upon your situation, that test might be at a more rudimentary level. Um, do not take do not interpret you are taking the test as meaning that you will be placed at a rudimentary level. There are advanced placement procedures that departments have. They are generally activated by that placement test. So see it more as the first step in the process and the placement data will come in, your credit evaluations will come in, additional placement procedures might um, come online and it will all come together eventually. But uh, my apologies if, um, for any uh, placement tests, which um, you will know upon sitting it that you will have to take some course probably beyond that level. So I was sharing my screen during this. I'm, I'm taking my first look at the questions right now. So I don't know if any, if Chris, any stand out to you as. Um, Yes, um, there is one about housing. I don't know if you might have the answer to that, the, the third question. And then there's one more related to um, in internships coming in uh, this this summer. And I may partially address that. I'll, I'll address the other question. I, I, uh, I typed an answer to one of the questions earlier about courses taken at the University of Chicago um, prior to matriculation. And I think that this specific question was in relation to dual enrolled credit. Um, and then there was a follow-up question just to clarify. And I do, I do want to clarify, uh, and I can, um, I can copy and paste the, the catalog copy into the answer here in just a second. But I, I do want to clarify or, or affirm that courses taken prior to matriculation are not eligible for transfer credit, even if they are UChicago courses. So dual enrollment courses or courses taken here during the summer prior or during the summer in high school um, would not count for transfer credit. They would not show up. Um, they, they wouldn't count towards your degree requirements. Uh, the one exception to that is are courses taken during the summer immediately prior to your matriculation. So if you happen to be taking a UChicago summer session course this summer, then, then that class um, will count toward your um, toward your degree requirements and, and will show up on your transcript. So I, I wanted to, to clarify that. Um, 
I'll say um, if you've seen something else online that says otherwise, please feel free just to, in an email to send that to me directly, and I can take a look at that just to make sure that all the information out there is, is consistent in what we're saying. But unless the course is immediately, the summer immediately prior to your matriculation in the autumn, then it will not, it will not count. To the to going back to the housing question, so the 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 question is that you mentioned that after our first year we are classified as the year appropriate for our graduation. Does this hold when it comes to applying for housing, since seniority has priority for that? I mean, formally, I, I want to defer to housing on that, Samuel. I'm not sure if this is anything that you've uh, come across. I mean, we do work with the housing office when it comes to when we uh, formally raise your level after the first year to whatever level makes sense. We do work with housing and pass that information along to them, but I, I don't know in terms of like the details of how that all shakes out. Yeah, my understanding is that after your, so traditionally a first year incoming student would be required to live on campus for two years, and then it is relatively uncommon to stay on campus after those first two years or six quarters. So as a transfer student, you're only required to live on campus for three quarters. So after that, it would be not necessarily impossible, but definitely less common to stay on campus afterwards. Um, I've also just shot a message over to one of our campus partners to see if I can get a little bit more detailed of an answer for you on that. And I'll interrupt, and not interrupt, but I'll pop in and share that if I hear back while the webinar is going on. So another question um, has to do with um, credit for internship. So are, are, are transfers eligible to receive credit for internships completed this summer? Additionally, are we eligible for any Metcalf grants, e.g. the emergency Metcalf grant? So for things related to career advancement, I would definitely refer you to that office. I mean, they, I mean, I can broadly say that they work very hard to support transfer students and to provide a lot of opportunities for transfer students that so that um, that a lot of opportunities that a lot of other students have as well. So um, but I, I definitely would want to refer to career advancement um, for a lot of those details. Uh, about receiving credit for internships completed this summer. I suppose I could connect a little bit with a prior question. Um, career advancement does have a, uh, a process for students who are pursuing summer internships that require credit in order to pursue the internships. So I'm not sure if that's part of the question. They do have a process for that. That credit doesn't ultimately count towards degree requirements, but we certainly have a process for making sure that um, we're we're doing whatever you need to do so that you don't lose out on that opportunity. Um, otherwise, credit for internships, that, that it might not be credit that comes towards your degree, but I would encourage you to work with career advancement and or your academic advisor just for when it comes to the specific details about um, uh, the opportunity that uh, you're pursuing. I just responded to the, the dining question. I provided the link to, to dining's website and they, they do have some FAQs that include how do I change my meal plan? Um, because I, that is, that's it. again, we, we need to defer to our campus partners um, for that. Um, let's see, let's see. Why do, why do AP scores or non-college classes count but not actual U Chicago courses? Uh, that may be in reference still to um, prematriculation pre credit. That is that is something that has been determined by the faculty that they are willing to accept uh, certain AP scores and AP courses. You'll notice from the list that that list is probably significantly shorter than than the institution you may be coming from. So that is a that is a academic faculty decision uh, to accept those. Um, and, and not to accept the, the prematriculation credit. So I, I'm not sure I can say much more than that at this point. Uh, and, and to again, reference back to the, the catalog policy. We do have another housing question about, could I potentially be placed with a freshman student roommate as a transfer? Um, again, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to speak for housing since it, that is very much a, a different office than Chris and I are based in. So. 
unless uh, Samuel, you have any special knowledge on that. Um, I, I just, I want to encourage students to, to feel empowered to reach out, whether it's to housing or to free advancement or to any office where you feel like there's information you need. Um, there are always people available to help. I'm not 100% positive on that. I do know that assignments are, um, in terms of the actual residence hall, going to be random this year. Um, but they also do take into account your lifestyle and living preferences that you submitted on your housing application that could play into it. But just as Alex and Chris have said, I would recommend contacting housing directly since this is the first year that we are um, having all of our transfer students join us on campus in housing. There's also a question about placement exams. It says, what would be the difficulty level of the placement exams compared to the AP exam or the U Chicago course equivalent? Uh, that's a difficult question for us to answer uh, and to quantify. So it's not clear what would be um, a helpful answer to that question from our position. I mean, the purpose of the placement exam is, is diagnostic. It's to help figure out what course at UChicago would be the right level for you, such that it's not too difficult, but also not too easy. And therefore, some elements of the placement test could be easier for you. And then as it goes on, it might get more difficult, and then it might get especially difficult. And I, But how it compares to an AP exam or, or individual UChicago courses, I, I, again, I don't, I, I'm not sure what, um, I'm not sure how to be helpful beyond that. Um, but I, do encourage you to take a placement exam and um, and you should do so. If you haven't done so, you should do so soon. And um, you will then be better judged than we could as far as uh, uh, what the comparison uh, of that is. But um, is there anything else on that one, Chris, that I'm, that I'm missing? I don't think so. I think that's that's a fair answer to that question. Um, that I, yeah, I'm not sure we can speak to the difficulty, but but it's certainly there to make sure that you're placed in the appropriate course moving forward. Um, there's a question about getting a job on campus first quarter and where can we find on campus jobs. Alex referenced uh, career advancement a couple of times in their the handshake um, platform, which I believe is where all on campus jobs are posted. Um, depending on your status, depending on whether you have work study eligibility or not, there are there will be jobs that will and won't be available to you. But my, I, do, I don't believe there's any restriction on um, having a job on campus during your, your first quarter. I would, however, uh, if, if you have specific questions about that, again, refer you to the Career Advancement Office for them to confirm. And you will have access to that handshake platform as soon as you are on campus this autumn. We have another question about placement exams and whether placement exams are the final marker of which class you are put into. Um, I'm going to answer that question a little differently for incoming transfer students than I would otherwise for incoming students because for transfer students, it's not just a placement exam. You also have transfer credit that could also be very impactful. So, um, and also you might be at a more advanced level than the exam, the placement exam of the summer is meant to test. So if your appropriate level for math, say, is analysis, um, you're not going to get that placement through the summer placement exam. What it's going to tell you is, all right, you're really advanced. Let's have you take a, an additional higher level test to determine where you're placed. And even after that, there's also your transfer credit um, that will take into account as well. And the math department will be helpful in figuring out the precise course that's right for you. So, um, so the placement exam is important, but it is one piece of the puzzle and for incoming transfer students. It is uh, something of a smaller piece than it would be for um, uh, traditional first year students. Um, I'll also say that even if there are no additional again, courses you've taken in that area uh, that would impact where you should start, it's still the case that, well, you should take the placement very seriously. If you really feel like the level is not right for you, every department has a placement change procedure that you can go through if you feel like you should be at a level higher or level lower or whatever it might be. You can speak with them. You should, you should be speaking with someone. Um, I think for all of these things, there shouldn't be pure self- selection. It should be based upon 
Um, ultimately, faculty input, whether through your transfer credit evaluations or through some sort of consultation that happens after your placement test. But, um, but uh, in all of those ways, it's a little complicated. It's your answer to the question is yes in some respects and uh, no in others. I don't see any other questions. I guess we can give it 10 seconds or so just to see if any, any pop up. Yeah, we're wrapping up with time right around exactly as we hope to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw the link in the chat to all of our summer webinar series recordings. This will also be posted shortly after. So if you joined us a little bit late or just want to rewatch any portion of the presentation from Academic Advising, you can check that out. It'll be on our YouTube page. Um, and other than that, if you do run into any specific questions, um, please feel free to reach out to your advisor. We strongly encourage it. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon, as well as our panelists. Thanks, y'all. Thank